There's a shifting of the atmosphere. There's a faith rising. I'm going to... This week is... Uh, we, we, we go fallow. We let our office staff all take a break. All of the healing ministries, restoration ministries, healing rooms, Sozo, all take the week off. The Channel of Blessing workers all get a week off. Some of the prayer ministries still going. Monday night's prayer is going. Tuesday morning men's prayer. So if... I didn't mention the ministry you're connected to during the week. Call and ask who you know, and they'll tell you. But we, we try to let this be a quieting season so we can launch. We will have Wednesday service, and then we're going we're gonna to use it kind of as our positioning to enter into the new year. We have a of, of heart position, because so much of everything functions from the heart. And if you can settle your accounts and bring your heart into a place, then it's like amazing. What could look like the end of a disastrous year all of a sudden opens the door to a a crazy victory year. And it's just, you never know. So that's what Wednesday's about, and I'm excited about that. And again, those uh, silver coins, if you want to sow and make that exchange, that'll be available. If you realize, hey, I've got to to tithe another $10,000 I wasn't aware of, Look at it positive. That means you have $100,000 you didn't know you'd gotten. All right, you know, don't, don't go, oh, no. I'll go, yo, yeah. Anybody want that problem before the year's out? <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> you can get any of that money giving to the church by, you know, postmarked by December 31st, given in the offering Wednesday. You can give online, donate, click give online up until, you know, 11.55 p.m. on uh, you know, New Year's Eve on December 31st. So thank you. And well, may, every, may every one of us come across the line just with a heart that's just expectant and anticipating the goodness of God. Now I'm going to take us through about five scriptures. It's kind of a prepping for our beginning of the new year. And I want to start with one of the scriptures we were using last week. Do you want to look at Mary and how her and Jesus grew up in their faith together. And then I want to take us to the sound of Eli- that Elijah heard, if I can, since 1 Corinthians 18, if we have time allots. And then we'll talk about this new picture of an awakening that's of, I believe, a vision of what God wants to do in and through each one of us. So there's excitement there for me. But if you'll go with me, 1 Peter, uh, Kim... And in, I, we talked about that faith attracts a testing, and a testing is, it's, 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 it creates, O King James calls it a sorrowful experience. It's not something we look forward to, but yet we're supposed to step into this cheerful joy and get all full of cheerfulness and, and go, whoa, I'm, I'm in another trial, yeah, yeah. which not, oh, is not always the first response of the flesh for sure and soul kind of freaks out because we're, the soul is trying to preserve its life and said it's going to learn to lose its life. And that's basically the lesson of from meeting Jesus to seeing Jesus is learning to not preserve but lose and seeing that in every loss is gain. So in First Peter, can you get up chapter 1, about verse 6, I think. I start talking and quit looking at my Bible. I'm getting so dependent. Now we'll go all the way up to back to uh, verse, yeah, Verse 3, please. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Second birth. Thank you, God. To an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that does not fade away reserved in heaven for you. That is the ultimate trust fund. Cannot be lost. Who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. We are kept by pow- the power of God through faith for this revealing of salvation in the last days. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, that's the key phrase there, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials. The if need be is not if you or I decide we need to this. It's, it's <laughs> Scripture and God. And most of the time, if it's a need be by the Scripture and God, you don't figure it out until you went through it. It doesn't, know, you know, it's just, but it is 
a part of faith. Faith produces joy. Joy allows us to move in forward. And with that faith then comes testing. And testing is something that we have to decide to come back up into the joy and not get swallowed up in the struggle. Or we lose that, that joyful experience until we re-engage joy and come back into victory. And God, in, in his infinite wisdom, can, can delay or extend the time of waiting however long he needs or compress it as how quick he needs it. So he is, he is not uh, worried about time, thank God. That the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So now it compares that this testing of our faith to the testing of gold. So like this silver, I forget the name of it, but it is 99.9% silver. Now how can they tell that? Because they burnt everything else away from it. They separated everything else through the fire. And that we would, none of us would go, hey, I'll buy one of those silver dollars that's in circulation now and pay you $25 because it's not worth the weight it's carrying. It's a symbol of money now. It's not intrinsic value because it is, it is just, it could be plastic and still carry the same value because the value is not in the material, it's, it's in what it represents. And that's what's changed our, all our economy. But we're not like that. God wants to say, God says, I'm, I, f- I want you as gold and silver to me. And now what happens is that through this pe- testing, there's going to come praise, honor, and glory through our faith at the revelation of Jesus. So something of God is going to increase make, is substantially because our faith itself found its purifying process. Whom having not seen you love, though now you do not see him, yet believing you rejoice with joy inexpressible, full of glory. And last week, the, the, probably the theme that I wanted to give everybody courage in is that faith brings joy, and joy is something we're supposed to live from and live in and access. And I don't find joy every morning, but if I take the time, I will find it. Joy comes in the morning. I've just got to go find it. There's a joy that can sustain me, carry me, and become, lift me into side to glory, even in the midst of the trial. It's receiving the end of your faith, the, sa- the salvation of your souls. And that ultimately, in the New Testament, is the greatest fruit of faith tested, is souls get saved. And I'm not talking about other people. That does follow. It talks about first my soul. My soul from being fragmented and frazzled and f- afraid and ready to, to be terrified and run and live a self-preservation life. It begins to live an abandoned life of just trust and, and confidence in the one I love. And even though he slay me, yet will I trust him. It changes the way I respond to everything. So let's see how that g- grew up inside of Jesus real quick. Turn with me to Luke chapter 2. And I'll find out where I want to look at. Luke 2. And this is where Brian did such an excellent teaching on the word becoming flesh. But let's go to a Luke 2, verse 15. This is after the shepherds have just had this incredible glory experience and have been heard from heaven by the angel and the army of angels that this is the Christ and you'll, he's been born, Savior, good tidings, peace, goodwill, all of this is wrapped up inside a little baby wrapped up in swaddling clothes laying in a manger. So they say, so it was when the angels had gone away from them into heaven that the shepherds said to one another, let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass which the Lord has made known to us. And it came, and they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. Now when they had seen him, they made known to him, made known widely. Well, I flip flop. Now, when they had seen him, they made widely known the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all those who heard it marveled at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. Now, the shepherds, they were a good mouthpiece for an, uh, an experience with God. And they created a sensation, just like the fires did this on Christmas Day up in Solomar, 
or just like anything that happens that just, wow, that's way out of the ordinary. And this was extraordinary. But Mary, on the other hand, took these words and let them go inside her heart, and she began to ponder them, keep them. And this was the, the, the very essence of what she had done the first day she would received the word of, of the promise of the child from Gabriel. She had just learned to hold things inside and allow what was being said to not be lost, but to be kept in her heart. Now, Jesus, they go to the temple 40 days later. They get another extraordinary word. And this time it says that that very sword, that very word, is going to be a sword at times and pierce your own heart, your own thoughts, your own intentions, because you're going to, you're going to be a, an example for the sake of many people who are going to learn how to fall on Jesus and rise again, fall into their own inability and rise in his ability. And you're going to be one of those who have to walk through that. So it's a, it's a perplexing journey that they're launched on. Now, things continue. They're off to Egypt. They come out of Egypt. They're living now in Nazareth. And when Jesus was bar mitzvah, maybe on the, his first bar mitzvah, on his, first, on his bar mitzvah, or maybe afterwards, he was at, in Jerusalem on one of the feasts with his parents. And so we're in, still in Luke 2, but now we're um, all the way up to, say, verse uh, 66. Now, um, what happens is the family travels in a caravan. It's, uh, you know, almost 100 miles from Nazareth to Jerusalem. So they, for safety and for convenience, they travel in groups. They leave. They assume Jesus is with them, but he stays behind because he is awakening to what's inside of him. Because unlike, he did not know he was the Christ when he was born cognitively inside his soul. His soul had to awaken to the truth, just as you and I have to hear the truth. It had to be by revelation. And now he's awakening to, I am the son of God. And I have a destiny. And I have purpose. And, and so he's just being drawn into it, which is the joy of the word of God and encounters with God. And they're unlimited. And there is no, there's no time when God's going to say, stop, don't keep asking me about who I am. Unless we are, you know, in an uh, uh, accusatory pattern, fashion. But if we're just exploring to discover and know him, he just says, come, follow me. Come inside, know me. But when they arrive, it says in verse uh, 46, now it was that after three days that they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. And so when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said to him, son, why have you done this to us? Look, your father and I have sought you anxiously. And he said, why? Did you not, why did you seek me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? But they did not understand the statement which he spoke to them. Statement is a, you know, kind of a poor choice of words because it's literally the word rhema. Or the spoken. They did not understand what Jesus spoke to them. So, back up. Verse 49, please. They didn't understand the statement which he spoke to them. You were right, Tim. Kim, you're good. You actually know where I'm going. God bless you, brother. <laughs> Even when I don't know where I'm going. Thank you. <laughs> now, when they went down with them, he came to Nazareth and was subject to them. But his mother kept all these things in her heart and Jesus increased in wisdom stature and in favor with God and man now in a minute we're going to look at what was happening to Jesus because he was now having truth awaken inside of him and having to live inside a system that would have seemed to be counterproductive to his destiny but first let's pause again and think about Mary Mary is going this is wow, he's really coming alive. This thing is really starting to happen. And she keeps these words. So she's just continually keeping them inside of her and enjoying what he's saying and, and growing in that sound. Jesus begins his ministry. If you go to John 2, Kim, and uh, when he, after picking most of his disciples or at least starting to associate with them, they go to a, fee, a wedding. Probably one of his family members. Might have been one of his brothers, sisters. Seems that his mom is in charge of the wedding. Is, Father's passed away because that wouldn't normally be her duty because in the midst of the wedding, they run out of wine. 
And so his mother comes to him. We look at chapter 2, um, verse uh, 1. Let's just start verse 1. And on the third day, there, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Now, both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. And when they ran out of wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. I just love that. She said to her, Woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour's not yet come. Evidently, you know, he understood his mission and she understood her, his, his grace he carried and she was going to access it. And his mother said to the servants, whatever he says to you, do it. And I want to pause to you and I want to say something very important because you hear me say this constantly. You cannot do the word of God. And I stand by that. It's to behold his glory and be transformed from glory to glory. But when he gives a command to do something sell this, buy this, leave here, go there. That's a thing to respond to because that's, that's a command of an action. That's like a directive. Does that make sense? You know, it's like a parent says, you go, uh, oh, would you go and take out the trash? Now, you'll never be, you know, in charge of the sanitation department unless you meditate on the whole scope of the trash detail. But you can't pick up the can and take it to the other can. So there's, there's a dual working of the Word of God. There is the spoken word of, I want you to go do this, and that we have to learn to be very attentive to because that's when things happen. So she had learned that this son who'd grown up into now a young rabbi carried a, a, a sound that if he gave a command of something to be done, it, if it was to be followed, there would be the answer of what she was looking for. So she didn't even wait for her son to say, yes, he would help. He just said, she just went to the servant and says, whatever he tells you, do it. Because that would be the way the release of the miracle. And so he says, fill up the pots of water, and it turns into wine. And it's an amazing miracle. Now, turn with me to Hebrews 5. Because it, it would sound like that Jesus just, you know, was like a man with superpowers. Just moving around and, you know, just accessing his powers whenever he needed them and accomplished whatever he wanted and just kind of lived above the earth. But the truth is that he really, from the day he discovered to choose evil, to choose good and refuse the evil, to come into his, his identity and begin to accept his calling, he had to live in agreement with truth that he himself could not produce or force to be applied. And that is a difficult thing. At the very end in the Garden of Gethsemane, we hear him make that prayer. Father, not my will, but yours be done. But if there's a way out of this, please choose it. But I won't demand it. I'm yielding myself to your will. But he began his ministry by saying, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Now, he had grown in that yielding his will to God's will from the age 12 when he was at, went back home to Nazareth and was subject to his parents in all things. Now, you'd think that he could have been like, wait a minute, Dad, I am not even going to learn carpentry. There's no need for carpentry, stone building, any of that because I've got a destiny way outside of your little thing. But he lived in humility. He lived in submission. He lived in, because the soul, the testing of your faith. In other words, your faith tells you you're one thing. Your circumstance try to tell you you're another thing. The testing of your faith is so that you say, will you hold that faith in the, in the opposite flow of circumstances? Because faith is not what you see. Faith is what you hear or what you see by the Spirit or see from the heavenly realm. So he's growing in his revelation of who he is while he's also mastering carpentry. Paulo, Miriam, nice to see you. Happy New Year. You, he's doing a dual development. And one track would seem to be not valuable, but it was valuable because you really couldn't grow in your revelation of who you were as a son of God unless you were walking in submission to what you were not. You, the, the submission, the yielding of the will is imperative, imperative in the, in the dis, fullness of our completion of victory. That's why you find yourself in a dead-end job or a situation you can't seem to get out of. That's your cross. That's your struggle point where you're going, okay, does this mean God's not faithful? No. Does this mean God's not going to do what he said? No. Does this mean that I missed it? No wait a second, what should I do? Should I let these circumstances 
frame my world. And what we learn is that I've got to go back and find my place in God. So I get up in the morning and I spend a little extra time praying. Because if I don't pray, my world is being told to me by what's coming at me. And I'm just like you, and my world will tell me who I am. And if it tells me who I am for too long, I'll act like what it's telling me I am. But if I go and spend some time with my father, he'll re reiterate everything he's told me before that got me into trouble in the first place. So my faith that gave me that great joy, but if need be, I was suffering some things that, if need be, suffering things get put back into its perspective as a light affliction for a greater, for a greater glory. But it happens because I reconnect. God does not have a clock for you. Hey, did you pray today? Did you do the hour? He could care less. You pray until you make victory, and then you go on. Sometimes you could do it in five minutes. But the bigger the trial, the longer it takes you to get the victory. Because it's just like this imposing imagery that just starts going. So you've got to go in and get the inner man strong, and get, get centered, and hear the voice of God, and get reacclimated till you're living literally in a different realm than the realm you're seeing, and the realm becomes more real than the world you're seeing, and then you begin to, di to know where, where the world's, where you're going by what's happening inside of you, and that, beloved, we are shifting into, but it's been a difficult season because in our dying, some of us have succumbed to this is who I am and my lot in life. When all it was meant to get your soul to yield and surrender and say, not my will, but yours be done, even if that means this cross that I don't want to walk through. So Jesus in, John, in Hebrews 5 very much has to be the very, you know, apex of this journey in the garden. He makes, it says of um, Hebrews 5 we'll begin at verse 5. So also Christ did not glorify himself to become high priest. This is speaking of resurrection. But it was he, Father, who said to him, you are my son, today I have begotten you. As he also says in another place, you are a priest according to the order of Melchizedek. This is who the Jesus is we are to know and learn and discover the resurrected Christ who sits at the right hand of the Father. Incredible person. I want you to meet him. You really got to spend some time with this guy. It's amazing who he is. But how did he get there? Who in the days of his flesh, okay, in the days of his journey on the earth, last three years of ministry, last three hours in the garden, when he had offered up prayers, that's petitions, supplications, is please, I'm asking a favor. With vehement cries, that's loud cries and travail and tears to him who was able to save him from death. Remember it says that his sweat became as, as blood? This was no, okay, Dad, we're going to just last hour and we'll finish this thing. This was, he said when he entered the garden, he said, my soul is so tormented, I'm at the point of death. I, I, pray with me. I don't know if I can hold my yielded resolve. And though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. The word suffered is an unfortunate word. It just means the pain he went through. Emotional pain, struggle, the, the conflict, the con... It, he was learning... To, and the word obedience is to, to hearken diligently to the sound. So he was learning through his journey that, oh, yes, I hear you. Oh, yeah, but I do hear you. Oh, give me up. Oh, yeah, I hear you. It's like I wake up every day. I go, God, this wasn't the life you gave, I was going to have. I mean, I'm in the wrong life. It's kind of like those old Disney movies when your dad wakes up this, this son or something. Wait, how did I get here? Because what I heard and how I saw what I heard would look like and what I heard and how I walked through things, not everything has been like up, 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 up. Right? So he goes on and he says, having been perfected, which means to make complete. So what Jesus did not have when he was born when he was bar mitzvahed, when he began his ministry, was a soul that had so submitted to the will of the Father in the face of all testing 
and go through the struggle that that really proved that Adam couldn't hold and thereby offer himself to be that offering. And then God says, now I have saved a soul and I'm going to, I'm going to set this as the new format for the new race of people that I'm creating, the life-giving spirits, the last Adam race, 1 Corinthians 15. And I'm going to make him the firstborn among many brethren. When Jesus walked on the earth, he was the only begotten son of God. But now he is not the only. He is the firstborn, the high priest of our confession. And this prototype, this person who now is the author and finisher, author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Now here the word obey is a different word. It means to hear under. To hear under. So I hear under Jesus. I listen under Jesus. I don't live an independent life. But I don't live a life that's trying to approve myself through self-righteousness. If I had anything I could do and undo of my journey, if there's like one thing, could you undo one thing about what you've learned in your 40 years? I would dismiss. I would ask God, although I did ask God, and I guess that's what 40 years you spent teaching me. I would ask God how I want to have a righteousness apart from works. I, God, I want to be free from self-righteousness, which I did ask God, and he delightfully has been answering that prayer <laughs> by making him for me to see my self-righteousness for what it is as filthy rags and incompetent and incapable of arriving at the destiny and receiving this, this, this wonderful Jesus, which Philippians 2 says is through the conformity to his death so that we can attain to resurrection, to have a righteousness not of our own. So it's happening. But I, I guess if I could change anything, I'd have it done in 40 seconds. Yeah. He's just like, while I'm sleeping, please. You know, wake me up when it's over, Dad. No, it's because the soul has to be a participant. I surrender. Yeah, yeah, I surrender. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Happy. I surrender. Happy, 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 happy. I'm happy. Oh, this is so wonderful. I'm losing everything. Yeah. Woohoo. Yeah. Whoa. Oh, that was that. That's another offense. Another word spoken. Oh, that's terrific. Woohoo. That's the journey. And that's why he says, be happy because it'll be easier. It's like give you a laughing gas to go to the dentist. Because the soul, come on, honestly, right? I mean, we're, we're ripping for Jesus when everything's going in our direction. Ask somebody to tell you, hey, sit down, and uh, we don't need your help right now. <laughs> Excuse me? You, you don't know what I'm saying. I, I carry something. Well, just sit down, and we don't need your help anymore. What? Do you know that God would never say that to me? And we can start a chain reaction to just show us who we really are. You, nobody knows who we really are until we don't get our way. As soon as you don't get your way, you start to discover who you really are. Ooh, that's not what I really want to be, but it is who I really am. So we try to keep, that's why, that's why I pray so much. Because I can't stand the way I really am. And I'm only changed for about a day's worth. It's, his presence lasts for about a day. By the time I'm waking up the next morning, there I am again, me in the flesh. Right? How many of you look good when you wake up? Woo! Yeah! You know, you're ready to show the world. Right? Woo! No, it's the same in our spirit, man. Our soul. You know, so here we come back into his presence. Now, we are becoming part of this glory realm. Now, let's keep going. He says he's um, having been perfected, made complete by the author and eternal of our eternal salvation to all obey him, called by God as high priest according to the order of Melchizedek, of whom we have so much to say. See, Paul's living in a relationship with Melchizedek, with a high priest. Most Christians don't see Jesus pass the cross. Maybe he gets out on Easter. But that's about all they know of Jesus, the one who walked on the Galilee. They don't even know the high priest. He's a cool. He, he lives, literally, Jesus stands in the presence of God for us. And when God looks at Jesus, he sees you. And when he sees Jesus, you, he sees Jesus. And you can stand in the presence of God in Jesus. 
and feel the total love, acceptance, pleasure, joy, triumph, victory, fearlessness. Anything you need is in Christ in the presence of God because he purchased it all, and now he is holding that place. That's his intercession for you. He's holding the place of your victory and your triumph. And that's why Paul could say, I don't care what I do, where I go, what happens to me, ministry or family, I'm always being led in triumph. That's all I know is every place I go, I'm led in triumph. Now think about that. If that really took over your mindset, oh, Johnny's sick again. I'm being led in triumph. Oh, not enough money at the end of the month. Oh, I'm being led in triumph. Oh, nobody likes me anymore. I'm being led in triumph. And we can tell ourselves that, but a lot of times it's our soul trying to convince our soul. Right? Positive mental attitude. Click, you know, change your confession, feel better. That'll work for the afternoon. But when you hit the spirit, man, and God says, shut up, quit whining, you're victory, victorious. God does tell you to shut up sometimes because some of our prayer is pathetic. (laughs) It's pathetic. Whiny, accusatory, unbelieving, and Old Testament rooted. And it's just like going backwards. Yeah, thanks for Jesus. I'm so happy he got me into heaven. But now that I'm working at becoming a perfected Christian, uh, I'm focused on the scripture and I'm keeping myself holy. I appreciate you, Jesus, but I'll take it from here. It's stupid, but we do it because your flesh feels like, hey, I got my second chance. Because your flesh is based in fear and pride. And, you know, so God has to at times say, just shut up and say what my son says about you. But don't do it with that arrogant attitude because that's really nasty. It's like a little kid trying to act like a big kid. You're not a big kid yet. Just be a little kid. Humbly worship me. And one day you'll grow up to be a big kid in my kingdom. How will you grow up to be a big kid? You just have to not get to your way for a long time. And agree with me that I'm the Lord and having my way in everything. And soon you'll start to live in a in separated identity from the realm that you're in. And you'll live in the realm that I'm in. And then when the day comes that I want to start to bring things to pass, boom, I can do it. Let's finish this, because it's so good. <laughs> I want to talk to you about this guy, this Melchizedek. That, I mean, so, oh, I want to talk to you about him. But you've become dull of hearing. You can't hear. You can't hear under. Why? For the, by this time, you ought to be teachers. You ought to, you, ought, you ought to be, but you need someone to teach you again. The first principles of the voice and the oracles of God, which you loved, your son, live in the Christ. You come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he's just a babe. For solid food belongs to those who are of full age or mature or complete, is what it literally means. That is those who by reason of use, practicing, have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. So that's the problem about this beautiful word becoming flesh is you have to practice it. And you have to practice, you know, you know, you you have to practice it means you have to make a whole lot of mistakes to discover the good and the evil and begin to separate the the tendency of humanity to move in the evil fashion of self-righteousness, kill anybody who doesn't believe the way I think mutilate anyone who's out of my order. You know, just that impatience of man. All religions carry that seed. And it's grown rabid. And it's going to get worse over the next few years. And yet there's going to be a people that are going to carry such peace and yieldedness. Sheep to the slaughter. God has an answer for ISIS. Bring the sheep for slaughter. Who wants to sign up? (laughs) Oh, I will. That's a noble cause. Okay, Let's practice. We got your name there. Ching. Now for your training. Oh, yeah. What are you going to give me? A gun? No. How about a broom? Oh, yeah, but that wouldn't. You can. Hmm. I'll give you. How about I give you a, a stupid boss who doesn't know anything? And um, while you're working unto me in this stupid situation, 
I'll give some people saying evil things about you because they're jealous of you. But they, you won't know they're jealous of you. You'll just know that they don't like you. And then with the rest of that training, I'll let you just kind of have kind of some difficulties in situations that aren't resolvable very quickly. Where you always had money, now you don't have money for a while. Where you always seem to be able to solve any problem, it just seems to be problems you can't solve. Let's just let, I'm training you for reigning. But he doesn't tell you that. Because if he told you that, it would take away everything from the training. Because the whole essence of hell is it has to convince you that you're actually in this situation because you're mis- you missed God, disobeyed God, God doesn't like you, made yourself out to be a son of God. So it wants to provoke you to say, this is not the place for me. I'm a son of God. You don't know who I am. I'm not made for a broom. I was never made to operate under a stupid boss. I need a boss smarter than me. I have to go high. I've got to go high. I can't go high with a stupid boss. That's like Jesus saying, I can't be the Savior with Joseph as my dad. But that is exactly how God trains people because the only way we would ever live, walk into that kind of potential martyrdom is a life that says it really doesn't matter whether I come out of this alive or don't because I'm already dead and I'm already alive. And I honestly don't have that. I'm not that full of love. Because little Stevie quickly hears that little voice. What are you doing with a broom in your hand? What are you doing in that situation? If you really were anybody, you could fix that problem. You could turn that bread, that rock into a bread. Come on, do something. Prove yourself. You're you're pathetic. And as soon as I'm going, I am pathetic. And I have this, just like this, this, you know, I just want to, I want to grab the lightsaber and vroom, 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 vroom. You know, show them that I've got the force. <laughs> and I'm trying to resist. Humble, don't, don't yield to the dark side. <laughs> and, and then just extend that as long as Star Wars is gone. Can you imagine that? You know, my first job after I got saved was to be an usher at Star Wars premiere in Ventura for six months I ushered they only had one screen in those theaters back then and we had lines and lines and I was so zealous for Jesus I was doing everything for Jesus and I didn't mind anything I had to do because I was filled with life I had no idea that almost 40 years later there I am going to this see it again (laughs) but that's part of how we journey that's how we grow up I wish it was different. I wish you could get quicker there, but you really can't because you don't know you. Only God knows you. And you don't know you until you get to see you long enough that you're fully convinced that what you see is really who you are, not who you think you really are. Right? We think we're something. I'm just, I would be wonderful if I could have my way. I would be the sweetest person you'd ever met if you just didn't cross what I want. If you, as long as you don't deny me, then I won't act ugly. It's really your fault that made me act this way because you're not right. (laughs) You know, we would never say that in church. We just think it in our heads. (laughs) (sighs) But after the season goes, and maybe it goes for years and years and years, there comes a season we have to reconcile ourselves back to God. And we have to return and say, Lord... Really, the only issue is you and me and me and you. And if what you said is true, then I need to embrace it for truth, and I need to enjoy you in the present, in the present moment and in the presence that you give me the opportunity to live from. And we begin to live there. And at first, and this has happened for me, at first we have to accept the reality of our world. Wow. It really isn't very good. Look at this thing. Whew. There's Sarah, 99. No, she's still hot. (laughs) But she's still barren. Look at me. (sighs) But there I am in the presence, and you start speaking. Look at me, presence. And you learn. I remember when God started, it was like 10 years ago, he said, I want you to see the fire that went through your life. I want want you to see the forest that burnt through. And I went, oh, oh. Gosh, it's so unfair, but 
That's what everybody says after a fire. The fire that happened yesterday, you know, on Christmas night. What, you know, how did that happen? Why did that happen? It shouldn't have happened, but it did happen. And then the Lord says, worship me here. So you remember when Job lost everything, lost his kids, lost his resource, lost everything? It says what he did is he went before the Lord and he worshiped. Because that's what God wants us to be able to do, worship in all situations, because that's our identity. And if we can live in a union through worship, then he can put us anywhere and change anything when he wants to change it or not let us, and we won't be changed by anything until time for it to be changed. So we can live in the midst of awfulness and enjoy God awesomely. So, and you get settled in that because that's the conformity to the death. And you're going, okay, all right, whatever. You're good, you're God, I love you. Can I have more time with you? Because that's the best part of my day is to have time with you. I just really, could I have a little more time? Because you are like going to the movies for me. You talk to me about a world that I'm not seeing, but I know has been a one being painted in my spirit, man, and growing up since I was, first heard your voice. And I'm coming under that sound. And now you're my high priest who is carrying that sound before God, and I can step inside of you and enjoy that presence and that voice and that sound. And it's so beautiful, I just want more time. And then finally, something happens. I don't know exactly when it started happening to me, but we'll talk more in the next weeks. But all of a sudden, you, I see myself not in a parched ground, not in a forest burnt down, but I see myself in a field of abundance. And I see myself in, in plentifulness in a broad place and triumph and sound and victory. And, and I'm going, whoa. And the Father says, yeah, this is now the place I placed you here on the earth. And you go and check real quick and go, no, it doesn't look any different out there. Yeah, he says, but now you worship me in this truth in the midst of that reality but this truth wants to override that reality I'm ready to override reality I'm ready now to change situation Jesus did only died and went down for three days it was all that was required for God to say rise up my son I beget you today you're my son and when he rose up he walked over to Satan took off his visage took off his power destroyed his ability took from him the keys of Hades and death walked over to the principalities and powers, the third of the hosts of heaven that had fallen with Satan, put them all under his feet, yeah. went down to the Kent prison cells and preached the gospel to the people in Noah's days that had been disobedient and led captivity captive, grabbed Abraham's bosom crew, and they just kept charging up. Yeah. You know when you have victory, I'll tell you when you know I have victory. You don't have to get out of where you are to have victory. You know when you have victory is when hell becomes your headquarters. Your hell becomes your headquarters. I'm just, well, whatever. He didn't have to rise from the hell. There's just nothing left to do there. <laughs> Seriously, there was nothing left for him to do. It was all done. And now we're learning to live in that truth. But we have to walk through our own hell to, re to realize that it really is true. Now, sometimes it's hard. Sometimes it's not. Some, you know, each of us have to learn to a level of how strong our soul is, how well it's become a self-preserved. Some of us are so smart, so quick, have such strong wills. Some of us can see things coming a mile away. Woo! Good. Thank you, but no thank you. God's saying, your destiny's over here. I know, but my death is over there, too, and I don't really want to go to my death. So is, I'm, going to look, I'm just going to hang out there. I'll close with this. You read the Bible, you go, oh, this is so good. Don't ever, if you're invited to a feast, go to the top of this, the, the wedding feast, go to the front table, because somebody greater than you might be in, invited, and they'll have to come and ask you to take the lower seat. So go take the lower seat. And then if someone sees you of greater importance, they'll call you up to the, be the better seat, and you'll have this honor. You can be humiliated or honored. Young man, 19, full of fear, but quick in my thinking. Go, oh, whoa, don't take the, the best seat. Learned a lesson. Got it. Thank you. Never do that. When God finally caught up with me and started saying, you know, you are the biggest liar I've ever known because you say you're doing one thing, but you're not doing any of that. And he took me to that verse and he said, here's what you really do. You know you're supposed to be at that top seat. But, and you know that I'm, ready, I'm going to bring you up and you're not really ready to commit yourself to the low seat, so you just kind of hang out in the lobby hoping somebody will see you. You're not submitted to the truth. You're not yielded. 
And that's what I wanted you to take, the role of just, okay, whatever, I'm good. Because, beloved, you are loved because of Jesus. You are accepted because of Jesus. You have eternity because of Jesus. Nothing is coming because of what we do to this thing. It's just we are becoming who Christ is by our journey with him in this thing. It's not changing our inheritance. Remember, it's in heaven, incorruptible, undefiled, ready to be revealed, can't change. Your destiny was given you before you were born. It's going to be just the way it was. It's just we're going to be this yielded company of believers worshiping this God, loving one another. We don't care you because we are so in tune with the, the resurrection because we have so submitted to the conformity to death. Isn't that just terrific news? Just imagine how close you are to death or resurrection or life. Stand up. <sighs> this new place is a beautiful place, and it's a place God wants to open to every one of us who are at that posture of, of resurrection beholding. But it isn't a place that is to hurry ourselves out because it's really no different than the place you can behold in the presence of God today. So I want to invite every one of us into the presence of Almighty Father through Jesus Christ, our resurrected King, our high priest of the order of Melchizedek. And through Jesus' death, burial, resurrection, his ascension, and now intercession, we can stand in the very presence of God inside of Christ, behold his beauty, and, be held, and to be held in God, by God, in Christ's beauty, and union, and joy, fellowship, and freedom, delightfulness. Father God, by the Holy Spirit, I ask you to can create for each one, open the door for each one of us, that place you've prepared for us in the presence of Papa. And Papa, for each one of us, we ask you to give us ears to hear Jesus knocking on the door of our heart to enter in and fellowship one with us. I ask you, Heavenly Father, right now, by the Spirit of God, as this year is changing on upon us, as you would reconcile all our accounts with you and our accounts be reconciled to you. That we would have no ought against anyone. We'd have no need for anything. We'd simply be a people dependent, yielded, trusting, yielding, loving, giving, praising, worshiping, stealing away, wanting the time away with you. In the name of Jesus, there's a door breaking open. Because there's prisons that some of us have found ourselves captive to. Prisons of regret, resentment, anger, fear. We've been in circumstances that have lived so long that they have now become our inheritance, it appears. And we see our no way out and things will never be the difference. So we have lost hope. And Jesus resurrect, resurrected Self through the ministry of Holy Spirit is to break down these prison doors, invade the places of our heart where we go, what, 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 what? And still our bruised, broken, frightened heart and carry us again back into destiny and confidence and quietness. To heal, to renew, to restore. If you can, or with the best of your own volition, just say, Jesus, come into my heart again. And to the very core of my being, help me, I need it. I can't make sense of where I am, but I know you know where I am. And the other thing that God is doing and will do is that he will take what to you is ashes and turn it into beauty. He will take for you what you would look upon as the source of your greatest sorrow and mourning and cause again from that place in Christ to become the greatest sense of joy and victory. He will take what is hell and kept you captive and make it your headquarters of your ministry. He'll take your poverty where you had no ability and make it a place of resource and victory and triumph. He'll take your disaster and make it, make it his, his field of beauty. Where there is desolation, he will make it the place of joy and gladness. I mean, come on. He's so good. We worship him. You see, the reason we have to do this is because there's nobody else but Jesus. 
Because nobody can do what Jesus did and does forever. It is never going to be about us. It will always be about Jesus. But the more we learn that, the more we can enjoy that. So Lord, allow that truth to rise up in us. It's all about Jesus. Never was anyone else but you. You did it all for us before the world began. You died and were raised again. But Lord, you lived out your life just as you've asked us to live out our life. So we say, Lord, come alive right now. Recalibrate us back to eternity. Take us out of the temporal insanity and bring us into eternal bliss and peace and joy. Right now, right now, because you can do it. Get us that joy again set before us. Come on, Father, you're the big one. You're the God who did it all and made it possible. Now, in the name of Jesus, we're through the lies that have been settled over God's kingdom and God's people and has darkened the world where, where the white witch has frozen people in their life. I declare the breath of asthma and the breath of Jesus, Holy Spirit, to breathe upon these slain and cause a resurrection where there's sickness, there become healing. Where there's hopelessness, there become new vision and new joy. Where there is poverty that has sucked the life out of people's feeling of freedom. It be obliterated with prosperity and an open heaven, destroying the lack. The souls of people be released again, saved in Jesus' name. Come on. Just imagine the rain coming again. Let the rain fall. Lord, we ask you to bless us, send us out, and prepare us this week. Help us journey with you this week. That whether we get our garage clean or not, we would be, our soul would be at peace and settled again and fresh in you. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, do it now. Amen. Amen. Bless you. Thank you. We're going to sing. Worship teams up front. If you'd like to get the silver coins, which were $25 silver coins, 740 donated to the church. You can buy one for $25. No tax benefit, just an exchange of money or a, a, a tube of them, 20 of them for $500. And uh, we'll have those to Wednesday. God gave us this gift. We give it back, pass it on. God bless you. Have a wonderful new year. See you Wednesday night, hopefully.